I know there's movies in the Yeah, I know it's fine. Yeah, I So I'll pull down that screen in a second. Um, but the reason I'm not doing it first is our first update is about our fish here. We had a fire maiden about the fish. <laughs> I mean, among other things. Uh, so context for that fish right, is Doug Walton, who used to teach this class and most of the stuff in the room uh, with his, including that stuff in the corner, which we're also going to work on. Uh, so we still got one fish and this huge tank. And we need to have a, a plan to feed it and make sure we keep it alive. Uh, so since we're in here three times a week, I volunteered us to have a class pet for <laughs> during lecture. Uh, so I told the rest of the professors that, that we would feed it Every morning we're in here, and uh, the going guess about how much to feed it is five of the pellets from that little container. So, does anyone want to feed the pellets right now? No? No one wants to feed it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just put it on top. Yeah, I just put them on top. Uh, nobody who's here right now really knows much about. How to take care of that fish in, in particular yet? So no. if it if it looks real hungry, we'll feed it more. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> we'll spend some time looking at it. Spies on them. Start bonding with them. Yeah. Understand them. I mean, I will. I will be and, and learn about fish now that I have said that. So the food says cichlid on it. So hopefully it's a cichlid. Hopefully. <laughs> Well, uh, current currently based on the feeding schedule, it looks like at some points he's been going like a week without being fed. So he'll be fine for the weekend. So yeah, he'll be good. But that's why I volunteered us to feed him every day we're in here because that's way better. Um, and. <laughs> Wait, do, does I anybody have fish, fish at home? Do, do you all know about fish? I eat fish. 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 I my brother but it was a terrorist, right? Because what? we had other little oh. fish. <laughs> and apparently my parents had to go down into the dining room where our fish tank was like every morning. And they would find fish that had like left out of the tank onto the radiator. Mm -hmm. And they figured out that they were running away from Goldie by Goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Huh? Where did it go? <laughs> did it run away from Goldfish? Okay. Now, like, does anybody feel motivated to look up this fish or have a fish identification app? Uh, well, we're more. Go ahead and do it. And I, I, I will erase everything. I feel emotionally yeah. responsible for it now that we're. We knew. We knew. So, uh, Judy or Admin in that room was. Feeding us sometimes, and uh, Dan went home. Our chair was feeding us sometimes. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do a better job. <laughs> we're gonna be nice to this fish. We're gonna be nice to this fish. I don't know if fish wants boys. We want the little cat. Oh, we can put it. It will. It will. It will fuck out. Hmm. It will fuck out a little bit. They're like the algae eaters. Hmm. Yeah. Well, first we have to make sure he's not going to eat other fish. Other I was going to say, I'm, I was. Given the tank is that big, I assumed that there was something else in there at some point. Unless he needs an awful lot of space. Uh, and until we can prove to ourselves we're responsible and can keep him alive, we probably shouldn't get more fish, but I think we can do it. I think it'll be good. Um, 
the faculty are uh, informally calling him Little Doug because oh my uh, God. Doug retired. <laughs> <laughs> but we can rename him for ourselves if we don't like others. I think that's kind of actually. Yeah, I didn't put that in my slide. But yeah, I like him. What do we do over there? Now. Yeah, uh, so sometime, I guess it's Friday, so probably sometime next week, we are going to, honestly, probably those look potentially impossible to clean, the, yeah. the two that are junky, so uh, we are going to get rid of them. I think we're going to dump a bunch of bleach in the water-filled one, really dirty, the really dirty one, because I found out from Dr. Retzholm that apparently people get sick cleaning out aquariums a bunch. Like there's yeah. a bunch of like bacteria or something in them that give you weird diseases, which no one mentioned to me or yeah, I guess my mother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do much special with our aquarium. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that one I'll probably just get rid of. Looks like the one next to it that also looks kind of dirty has dirt in the bottom. So we'll take a look. But that one in the corner looks good. And I think there are a couple under the like in those cabinets. So we can get that kind of in here. I actually grabbed yeah all sorts of stuff in here. I grabbed one of the tanks last year and took it up to the greenhouse on the roof and I'm growing mangroves in it. Uh, which I also don't know how to do, but they're they're doing great in tap water and some pebbles. So uh yeah. So we'll like expand what we have in this room and we'll, we'll make it look nicer by the end of the year. But we're gonna start with uh, not killing little bug. <laughs> so good? All right. So I'm gonna make sure we do a, a fish feeding check every morning to make sure someone in the room has done with it. I don't know if you can overfeed a fish. Do you think you can overfeed a fish? Yeah, I probably killed one. Yeah. All right, okay. So they just don't stop eating them when they move around. They're kind of close that up. All right. So what you're saying is, if we fed it too much, it would get fat. Yeah, we I mean, noticed. Okay. So one my brother had was way smaller. Okay. You know what? I mean, yeah, it's a good thing. But like, it does seem like it should Yeah. Oh. Oh, like we can. This is up to three times daily. Oh, okay. Well, can you can say. Um, if you want a whole week without eating. Uh huh. Yeah, a whole semester. Yeah. Um. Apparently, if you overfeed it, it can like mess up the filter. Because then the food breaks down. Well, I think that it goes back to the end of the time. Like it's not clean, but then it really is. Yeah, yeah that doesn't so really do anything yeah. specific, but I guess that makes sense because they're very different sizes. Right. It's actually important to figure out what it is. Yeah. I don't think it's that. So my <laughs> guess while well, yeah. not looking at it was this, but. I wasn't looking at that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Does it look anything like that? It looks like it. It's got a black spot in here. Maybe you don't think it's bad. That looks a little too small. The fish do sometimes like, like this. Yeah. <laughs> fish do like change their coloration sometimes. Like salmon over there. Almost like. Yeah. They can look cool. Yeah. 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 the Yeah. 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 I don't know how to fish, but I tried fishing over in Chester Creek. <laughs> no, I thought it worked. I saw a 12 year old just like, I didn't mean to go, but he was 12, just like putting 
fish after fish after fish in his, the bag on his belt. And I was like, oh, God, he didn't like. <laughs> I, I wonder what he was catching. It's it's it is, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, I bought like a $10 pole at Walmart in a fishing Yeah, I'm like, I went out there. I went out there. Water was so high that the water went into like, uh, my later. Oh, that's uh, yeah. That rubber yeah. 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 cold. <laughs> <laughs> I told my dad never. Really? Oh, does it get like warmed up from your foot? Yeah. Is it really gets okay. like it's cold? Well, that situation. No, no, we're talking if it goes over the top. Oh. So you're getting. Yeah, and then I had to play that Yeah, that's all right. That'll do it. I did that one year. I tripped over a log in the river. I didn't realize that there was a log. What face first, filled the whole thing up to like I here. I, I really don't have to put it in and take it out of the dock. Like, at least oh, you're trying to mess with the I wrench. Know. Like, out there, sometimes you have to go a little farther and you're like pretty close. Like, a wave will come in and just whoosh, like yeah. send water down. Yeah. Nice. You just change at that point? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 like, you can change yeah. it. Yeah. Then you, yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. Get those like, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I took a coral reef course in college and we like wore wetsuits and they told us that the first thing you should do when you get in the water is pee in your wetsuit to keep yourself warm, which was real interesting advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, like but they literally said that. Like they teach that. Yeah. Stupid eyes. Yeah. That's like a big thing. What can you do? Like once you break a certain part, like the cold, like if you're doing scuba and like there's a cold level, and you want to break the cold level, you can do it. Yeah. Like that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it's like you can like you can do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
one of the things we have showing up in the Triassic is the pterosaurs, which are our first flying vertebrates. So we were looking at the very end of class with their, their wing structure. So how they did this. So we mentioned before when we were talking about like gill arches turning into things like jaws, this idea of exaltation, right? So taking something that was for something else originally and turning it into something new, giving it a new function. So the pterosaurs have this crazy long fourth digit, so like one big finger that they've used to make a wing underneath. So this is a different way of forming a wing than our birds and bats. So birds are kind of using their whole arm here and they've used up their finger bones and their wrist bones. So our like basically the palm of your hand are the metacarpals here. So that's what that is. Phalanges are like your fingers. So birds have kind of fuse them together into this wing tip structure. Here's the forearm. Here's the like arm from the elbow to the shoulder. Bat wings uh, are long spread out fingers, right? So that's kind of a bit more like a pterosaur, except they did it with just one of their fingers. So we're going to take a look more at some pterosaur stuff today, including, I also found, you can see I was in a real serious mood while I was pulling pterosaur stuff for us. Um, found him on TikTok. First, thank you to everyone for time here. Second, thank you to the man who fixed that pelican here. Yeah. <laughs> that noise really does remind you that Dinosaurs and birds are related. Pterosaurs, however, not more related to pelicans than, than dinosaurs. Pterosaurs straight up dropped out. So this is a pterosaur that probably hunted like a pelican and had a big pelican that it could eat things in from the ocean. And I wanted to tell you about it for a few different reasons. First, it just looks like a big terrifying pelican. I love that. But also, it's time to detain his Icron Draco avatar. And I can tell that that is a relatively recent discovery because this is an Icron. And it's from the movie Avatar. <laughs> His name is Icron Draco Avatar. It's this dragon avatar. They're just, there was there are two avatar references in one name. So just like our Han Solo solo trail bite, we got some we got some fun stuff in the pterosaurs. Oh so can play over and over again. Okay. Other things I found uh related to our pterosaurs. I was trying to find some nice pterosaur pictures to put in with our pterosaur stuff. And I found out that you can buy pterosaur fossils. So there is in general, like a fossil trade. Uh, we mentioned that the trilobites are pretty cheap, uh, like a couple bucks. Uh, pterosaurs, if you, well, they're more expensive. So they're larger and more rare, but that's not too bad for, for a pterosaur too. If you want a pterosaur uh, long bone, so wing bone here, it's pricier, but um, I thought that was kind of crazy. I'm not going to be buying any. Uh, if you want to or want to check out what they're selling on this random website, I put the link in there. <laughs> uh, hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're real. So, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of crazy and like, I don't know. I wonder if it's an ethical question, but like, if you find fossils on like private land, my understanding is that if it's your land, those are your fossils and you can do what you want with them. So like there are plenty of fossils that are like not in scientific collections, right? Like a really rich dude can just like have a tea that's in his house. Right, <laughs> he has enough money to buy a T Rex fossil. Uh, so that does lead to like questions of like, is that a good thing? <laughs> Should there be rules around that? On the other hand, it's kind of cool to own fossils. Some fossils are like more common and more important than others, right? Like these teeth, right? Just kind of look like teeth, but <laughs> but but bigger full skeletons is is kind of more debatable. I think. I'm vaguely remembering this. I hadn't planned to talk to, about it, but I think the uh, T Rex, too, the big one that's at the Chicago Field Museum, I think 
they had to get in like a huge bidding war to get that T Rex. There definitely like was a big bidding war over a big T Rex fossil, and like museums were like all trying to pool their money and compete against like private collectors so that they could have this potentially important fossil to put on display and do research on and stuff. So I don't know that much about like who owns the private fossils, although uh, I know a guy, <laughs> like, <laughs> or like more specifically, like I know a guy who knows a guy, and so I followed him on Twitter back when Twitter was Twitter, who like is professionally uh, a gem collector and salesman, and also collects and sells fossils. Um, and his online presence is like cool and educational, but it's it's weird that that's like a career, right? Yeah. Like that's a job. I mean, I well, think it's a job he made for himself. It does feel black market, right? <laughs> Except for this was just on the normal like internet, yeah, I mean, right? It, it does, doesn't it? Right? It it, it feels mm -hmm. kind of sketchy. I feel like it could be wrong. <laughs> I feel like it could be okay. Too. I no, like depending how you feel about it. Yeah. I just feel like there's no reason why like, a museum couldn't own it. I feel I feel like the rule should be something like that, right? Like right. you can own it, but you have to let people come see it and measure it and scan it or whatever. Right. Like, or right? To someone for like a year to do. Yeah, you have to be willing to put it on loan right. or like. You know how historic houses like to keep their like special tax status or something? They have to like let the public see them. Yeah. So they'll open it like a couple at Tuesday afternoons. And then they close off most of the building anyway. So you'd be like one room. Yeah. Remember how we have those Jackson homes? They were like arguing about that for a while. Oh, I haven't heard about those. Because we're like have been there since the problem was like founded. Mm -hmm. And then they're kind of like, um, yeah, there's a lot of Are they cool looking? What? Are they cool looking? Well, they, it's all brick. Like, Wait, what was that? In Belle Plaine, we have a two story outhouse. So, so like, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's exactly what you said. Yeah. I don't know. How does the second story work? No, I don't know. I've never been inside it. But, like, from the house to the out, the second story of the outhouse, they have, like, a walk. -up. And then mm -hmm. the first one, you just have to walk outside. One I hope they're like yeah. offset. Yeah. Not, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> Definitely want to use the upstairs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And can you see that? I don't know. I never tried. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You just know. I just know where it is. It's mm. not by the park. Yeah. I I like going in old buildings and, and seeing what's in them. I like going in buildings in general, right? Like yeah. sometimes it's fun to just go to open houses for like houses that are for sale just to see what it's like inside. <laughs> but yeah, so fossil stuff. Sometimes some sometimes kinda kinda some ethical questions in there about whether it should be the, the way it is. Okay. So here are two pterosaur fossils. So this is what like a relatively complete one looks like. What did you find? The yeah, I'm going to look that up later. Um, so can you guys see what's going on here? This one they've spread out nice, right? So you can see that that really is like a long finger. Here has the rest of the hand. So here's what it would be like the forearm, so like from the wrist to the elbow. Uh, I think actually no, those are probably wrong. Those are probably the metacarpals, and then wrist to elbow, elbow to shoulder, creating that wing structure. And you can see actually, we mentioned eye bones. Bit whatever day the other day was Wednesday. Uh, so you can see that this pterosaur actually has one. So I pulled out some some pictures of what those look like in other species too. So that's an actual bone there in the orbit in the eye socket. And you can see that they come kind of crunched up as well. Both of these are, are really good. Lots of other fossils, you just find parts of them and that's true for pterosaurs as well. So that's how I ended up on that fossils for sale website. <laughs> I was looking for, for one we could actually look at and try and figure out 
what was going on. Because uh, our modern understanding of pterosaurs and representations of pterosaurs are definitely different than what people thought was going on when they first found pterosaur fossils. And also, from what I what I gather, what I can tell, like even like current pterosaur research, they're they're an argumentative bunch, right? Yeah. Like 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 they have a bunch of different ideas about pterosaurs, and they fight somewhat publicly <laughs> about about their theories. Yeah, like if you want to read the like Wikipedia section on on what's going on in pterosaurs, uh, it, it's kind of funny, and, and I pull I pull. One, one example of one of their pterosaur fights uh, in a second. Okay. So this is an aside about that ring in the eye. So this isn't specific to pterosaurs, um, but actually lots of species, including birds, uh, have these sclerotic rings, they're called, in their eyes. So here you can see an owl skull with it in place where it goes. Right, so in the eye, and here they popped it out. So that's not like plastic or anything for the presentation at all. That that's like an actual bone that they have. So when we were like counting uh, the antorbital fenestra and those temporal fenestrae and stuff, that's why that that like blue circle was there partially. Uh, so partially because it is real and partially also kind of to help us be able to tell what we're looking at. So the sclerotic rings are actually like a combination of a bunch of like little bony plates that make the circle. So like a bunch of stuff fused together. And you see them in all sorts of stuff, birds, lizard, turtles. Um, exactly what they do, maybe kind of depends on what the animal is doing. But some of the suggestions include like, if you're diving, especially diving underwater, hitting the water hard, that this can kind of help your eyes not implode. Um, so you see them thicker, bigger in diving animals. Obviously this owl is not a diving animal, so I don't particularly know what the explanation of the function in a great horned owl is, um, but allows them to do more stuff with their eye, have more structures to work with, uh, kind of stabilize the eye. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so those are real. And here are some pictures of some species that have them. So you can see them in this fish, this barracuda. You can see them in all sorts of places. So it's kind of, I like it. This one looks really fun. Like it's kind of floating in. Okay. So pterosaurs have them too. Okay. Yeah. So next we got some pictures of <laughs> how they thought about these things in the past, right? So when people in the past found random bones, right? They had they had to come up with some ideas about what was going on. And I'm I'm not I'm not like making fun of them, making fun of them, right? Because science is all about coming up with an idea and then changing it as you find more data, right? So uh, they were doing what they could do, and we have adjusted since then. Uh, but this is a pretty funny drawing, uh, and this this is like pretty bad. We're we're gonna go through uh, some of what makes some of these pictures bad uh, as we move forward. Like um, there's stuff very obviously wrong with the toes and the fingers and stuff in this image. Um, but this guy, Edward Newman, drew it in the late 1800s. I think this this one on the bottom is pretty funny, right? Like that was a pretty good facial expression. Uh, the ones in the background maybe look a, a little more yeah, realistic. Huh? They look way more like their first, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and they also don't look the same, right? Like this top one and the bottom one. Yeah, but he suggested that pterosaurs were flying marsupials. So that's like kangaroos and possums and stuff. So so you can see uh, why he made this possum face oh, wait, based on that. Wait, he thought they could fly around with it. 
kids in a pouch? Like, he thought they had pouches, too? I don't know. If he, I mean, if he thought they were marsupials, he, like, right. must have, right? Maybe that's the better. The kid oh, you think it fell out of the house? <laughs> you know, I I thought it was being attacked, but I, I like that. Yeah, maybe she's just trying to catch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's fun. <laughs> Actually, the tongue part, I think, is potentially more, more realistic. Um, but yeah with the tongues i forget what trade it is but they they found something that looks kind of like it looks kind of like ant eater like and they have those long, those long kind of tongues so i don't know what exactly it was but maybe who knows Okay. Uh, so I don't know who made this drawing, um, but they've also been reconstructed at times as aquatic, so like swimming, so not wings and flying at all. Uh, so some people thought these were maybe flippers. They belong flippers. Yeah. So actually, when you see bones set up in a museum, right, like in some exhibit, in some display, kind of quote unquote lifelike. That is actually also, right, like in a way, a hypothesis about like how they were positioned and connected, right? Because when they die, the bones get scattered on the ground. Um, they're almost never in a really lifelike position. If you get one fossilized in a super easy to understand way, it, you're kind of lucky. So there have been cases where they like put together the bones in really weird ways um, and they've changed how how they mount skeletons uh, kind of over time as they get more data on how they think these organisms were actually positioned but yeah here's a here's a swimming pterosaur <laughs> here's here's a bipedal pterosaur so this one is yeah i forget now that we're looking at it. Was Petrie in Land Before Time a pterosaur? And did he walk kind of like that? <laughs> I haven't watched that since I was an actual child. <laughs> hmm? They've made like so many of them by now. Okay. I know. Well, that's why I remember he exists. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So we get that. Have some some tiptoeing, uh, pterosaurs, and you know there were things that that did weird stuff. They have somewhat recently found um an ancient kind of crocodile relative that this is, as far as they can tell is a bipad and, and walk straight upright. I would not like a crocodile taking me on two feet mm -hmm. standing up. Uh, that does not sound cool. That does not sound fun. Um, but that's why I like paleontology, right? Like it's, it's quite funny sometimes. <laughs> and it's fun to imagine. Okay. And so here we have a toy that some pterosaur scientists picked up in Mexico in 2008, and we can use it as an illustration to look at some pterosaur traits, mostly by by figuring out what is wrong with this pterosaur. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't. It looks like more like a bow wing. Yeah. Here, where it's got the fingers coming all the way down to the wing. Mm hmm. Which means that like. How many fingers would that make this be? Yeah. Make this. A lot. Right? Like that's that's gonna be too many fingers <laughs> if we have them there. All right, at least at least like six, seven fingers in there. 
Do you see anything else? We haven't talked that much about like exactly all the different territory traits that we're we're gonna go for some more. But mm -hmm. yeah, there there's some stuff wrong with the tail. <laughs> Here's like half the giant thing on the back of the head. Or I thought it kind of rounded out. Yeah, I mean they had crests, but yeah, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh so very nicely um a paleontologist at the university of london wrote a long complaining blog post uh, about this pterosaur toy and his blog is cool like it's fun it's got a lot of dinosaur stuff on there and a lot of pterosaur stuff but helpfully <laughs> he, he's got he's got some complaints here right so i pulled up a comparison pterosaur here on the side from that previous image. The toy is obviously like not any specific pterosaur, so we can compare it to whatever whatever one we want, right? Uh, since it's not labeled as a species, right? And it's got a weird arrangement of the head there compared to the body. Honestly, like I don't think that wing looks even long enough compared to the finger on at least this fossil. You're right, the crest is not good. <laughs> right? There, there doesn't happen to be a crest on, on that angle fossil, but yeah, the, the crest is the wrong shape for the crested ones. Um, its neck, even though it like looks long, actually is is not long enough. It's missing some wing features that we'll, we'll take a look at in a second. Um, but the propatagium is like a part of the wing that's kind of like in front of the arm, um, which it should have as a pterosaur. Its fingers are not the right size and should be going the other direction. Uh, it's, yeah, its wing finger isn't long enough. It's got the bat wing, so if we count how many fingers this is, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, right, because we're interpreting one at each of the little points. Um, we we mentioned a brief, like, tetrapods that, that survive don't have that many fingers. Like, we got five or fewer if they fuse together loose digits. We, we don't see anything with extra anymore. Okay. Uh, what was the order of these things? Yeah. Uh, pterosaurs actually were not scaly, right? Uh, and you think, if you think about like wings, right? Well, nothing that I can think of today has scaly wings. So I don't think that would help you fly very well, right? That's, that's not going to be great for like lift or friction while you're flying, right? You don't want a bunch of drag on your wing, um, aside from the fact that. Hmm? Is that what they're called? Drag? Drag? Oh, right? No, you heard that, right? <laughs> I heard that. That's a, that's a cool idea. Probably not, right? They probably named them like longer ago than that. That would make sense. Right? Yeah, they probably named them like longer ago than English. It's Greek. Yeah. Uh, oh. What did they name it for? Uh, the English word dragon comes from the Greek word dragon, which was used originally for any large serpent. And dragging them down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. 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 Uh -huh. yeah, first okay. season, a little slow to start, gets going real good at the end. Okay. Season two looks like it's really cool. worth it. Yeah. If you like Game of Thrones. Yeah. 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 So, weird body, weird wrong legs, <laughs> weird toes. Uh, we'll talk about the Europatagium in a second and define that, but that's basically like it should have some wing between its legs too. Its long tail is not on this fossil, but like also just in general 
shouldn't have a, a long tail based on other stuff on this. If it's a pterosaur, it would have had a tail, which some of the old ones did, some of the, the earlier pterosaurs. Um, this bit on the end, this kind of swelling is the wrong shape, even if it is supposed to be a pterosaur with a tail. So there, so there are some fun things. Okay. So those two like wing vocabulary terms are, are highlighted here. So we're going to see them in other groups, including birds, dinosaurs, bats. Uh, so they're, they're worth thinking about. So the propotassium is like a skin fold here at the front. Um, so we're looking kind of like a skin flap in your elbow. Right, is what we're looking at. So here is kind of the same picture zoomed in and looking at muscles that are in modern bird wings. So here we have the elbow joint here. So the shoulder would be there. So we're zooming in right there. We can see arm musculature like going along it, but we can also see there's even a muscle like in the front edge of this propotagium in birds. Uh, so we have evidence that pterosaurs should have this. You see that the bat also has one, right? Like it's just helpful if you're flying, right? If you if you want to have lift and not like have a weird notch missing from your wing, right? Like you, you want kind of a, a smooth structure for flying. Right? Planes don't have missing triangles either. And the uropotagium, like euro is like urine kind of thing. So that's the part between the legs. So here on bats, we, we've got kind of a big one going like kind of all the way around. Um, and in pterosaurs, it should be kind of one on each side of each leg. So like not having their legs totally stuck together because they do walk around on land at some point. So that wouldn't be super useful. But we do think there should be a uropotagium here. So you can see that this image is from a, another person who has strong opinions about what pterosaurs should look like. <laughs> so this is a detailed image of uh, complaints about common pictures of pterosaurs versus their preferred version of pterosaurs. So they're, they're pointing out like all the different pieces um, that are problematic here. So we got finger stuff again, we got your potassium stuff again, we have pro potassium stuff again. So actually you can see that their complaints about this actual more like scientific modern published model are in many ways similar to complaints about that plastic toy, if that's like much more detailed, right? <laughs> because this one like actually kind of put in some bones and positioning and didn't do it great, at least uh, so, so far as this person is concerned. Okay. Yeah, so here's a, another uh, sort of current pterosaur fight going on. So this is a relatively recent example. I couldn't find a date for this picture, uh, but this guy, David Peters, was going to a bunch of important paleontology conferences in the 2000s at, at some point, vaguely. And he is a paleo artist. He likes to draw fossils, um, including pterosaurs. And he even presented something on pterosaurs at a paleontology conference, but he doesn't actually have any scientific training in paleontology. Like, I couldn't find a list of any degrees that he might have. Uh, <laughs> presumably, he has some degrees in something, um, but definitely not like an academic paleontologist, for sure. These are kind of fun images. <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, an associate curator of vertebrate paleontology who does have a bunch of formal training and like regularly publishes papers on pterosaurs and stuff, uh, described this publicly as an outrageously bizarre, like 
Dr. Seuss's imaginary animals <laughs> when he was looking at these drawings. And there are lots of similar complaints uh, about some of his drawings, including, I was kind of sorting through looking to see if I could find any other fun pull quotes, right? And one of the problems with this guy's work, right, and, and the way he's doing Sarah's or research or interpreting stuff, um, I found a description that he basically like uses Photoshop on the fossils themselves, and he says that he came up with like a special way of analyzing low quality photos to find new things that the quote-unquote researchers can't see but he doesn't like actually look at the fossils right like he doesn't like go through the fossil <laughs> as far as I can tell like maybe that's changed recently right um and I found out that a guy I actually know pointed out he's like yeah he interpreted a scratch I made when I was digging out this fossil that I know I made as like a frill on the pterosaur itself, right? So there have been multiple instances where you interpret some random scratches on on rock or places where the researchers know that they like sanded the stone there, interpreting those marks as like actual pterosaur parts. So this is fun though. I like looking at bad images is sometimes even more more fun than looking at the the real stuff. Partially because you can actually think about it, like, oh, why did they do that? And then it, it, it makes thinking about why the fossils look the way they do kind of kind of more impactful, at least to me. I like this thing, this like saber wing thing. Weird. Okay. So here are some potentially more more realistic pterosaurs. I didn't go through these one by one and make sure that they were totally right, but uh, we have some of the pterosaur features depicted on here. So here we have a much different looking crest here. So they have more kind of like curved crests when we see those crests, which were probably for things like mating displays, right? Or sexual selection kind of stuff, which is why they're often drawn as like brightly colored and we can talk about it later but they they actually are starting to do analyses of like there's actual scientific evidence for like what color things were right that's why dinosaurs have started to be drawn with more colors rather than just like brown and green is that they're starting to look at like actual pigments that they can find like fossilized and thinking about like how they can bend light i've seen some weird papers about like we shone light at this living bird's feathers and compared how that refracted compared to this thing we found in the rock and kind of crazy the things that people are doing okay so the colors are not just randomly made up we got claws on our pterosaurs and we got that fourth finger attached to the wing then we have also webbing at the back for that europtagium early pterosaurs and only early pterosaurs as far as i can tell had tails but the tail should have like sails on the end so that's that's what was described as the tail vein and that complaint about the toy so think like weather vein um and they have specific shapes and they're roughly kind of like big triangles <laughs> they should have teeth if we're if they're early pterosaurs um and then we do develop a, a beak kind of later on. Uh, and they shouldn't have scale. And so here we see a kind of kind of timeline in cartoon form of our pterosaurs. So they're appearing during the Triassic, which is why we're talking about them now. And then we're going to see them through the tri uh, through the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And they're gonna die out at the end. They're pretty long lived, and we got lots of types of pterosaurs. This is most of that just just written out in kind of bullet point form. Uh, let me see if I put anything different on here. Yeah, so we're looking usually at the big pterosaurs because I like big things and I think they're cool. Uh, but the early pterosaurs were 
often small. Uh, so like sparrow size, kind of insectivores catching insects. And then they get larger later on. The really giant ones tend to be the later ones. So the larger pterosaurs were probably fishing, catching animals. And the really giant ones, they think maybe were scavengers actually. So they got crests on their head for mating, don't have scales. They do have claws and all sorts of webbing. And the early ones have the, these long tails, but not so much later ones to get further on. So we're putting them in archosaurs. So that group we talked about with the lead up into our dinosaurs and birds. So, so we started talking about archosauric traits on Wednesday, looking at some of those traits in the lower limb. At, at the end of it, we had we had a list of those. Um, starting with crocodiles on the phylogeny. When we see pterosaurs in the fossil record, so like out and about, we haven't really found any good transitional fossils. So we don't have anything that we've seen that we think looks like half a pterosaur, right? With half a wing or something. As far as we can tell, the first thing that we can tell is a pterosaur was already flying. So we, we don't have great data on exactly what that transition looked like, which means there are also scientific debates on why and how they started flying, which basically sum up to, were they something that was in a tree, like a lizard in the canopy kind of, that started gliding and coming down? So that would be this tree down bit, or were they something on the ground that was jumping and then jumped higher and higher and higher and developed a wing kind of for lift to, to continue that? So jury's out on, on exactly how that developed. So we have some smaller pterosaurs depicted here. So we've got one jumping from a branch here, kind of hopping along on the branch. So I guess. This might be almost a sort of in-between hypothesis here. And here we have some funny, funny bird-like looking pterosaurs, quote unquote, going for maybe moths and stuff. And next week, I think we're gonna, gonna start talking about our dinosaurs, but when we're playing that game at the beginning of our last session, we're looking through things that were and were not dinosaurs, right? So we're going to go in detail on dinosaur traits. And there, there are some features that, that change within dinosaurs that lead to our major groups of dinosaurs. But one of the things that we really talk about and look at when we're dividing our phylogeny of dinosaurs and our different groups of dinosaurs are there hits? That's going to be one of the first kind of divisions between our dinosaurs, which are colloquially kind of referred to as like lizard hips versus bird hips. Um, but some of the traits that are sorting out the pterosaurs from the dinosaurs, the reasons that they're not showing up in that group is that they have a, a different form of hip. So you can see here the pterosaur on the right, we got T-Rex over here on the left. So we're going to be looking for um, specific shape to those hip bones in our dinosaurs that pterosaurs don't have. So they're going to be missing a hole. And now that we've been looking at skulls a bunch, we know that holes are important, I guess. Uh, at, at least holes are kind of diagnostic for helping us identify things that we're looking at. This is a picture of femur going like into the hip. Uh, so we're also going to see that they're missing part of that as well. So they're missing a, a kind of crest there. So basically there are some very specific skeletal traits that separate them out because we see these traits in basically all of our dinosaurs and none of the pterosaurs. So they're cool, they're extinct, they're doing weird shit, but 
not dinosaurs. And so to round this out, we'll take a look at them not flying because they also walked around and that's pretty funny. And we have some cool pterosaur trackways. Name those, but when you become pregnant, 
he wasn't assigning the tracks to any single territory. He was just broadly identifying that the tracks were made by some kind of territory. But even general identifications like this, like the arguments surrounding among the territories themselves, here at Ignis Fossils also have a long history of debate when it comes to who the tracks were really made by. Jones published his paper identifying the tracks as belonging to the territory in 1887, based on the unique anatomy of the sun and bricks shown in the tracks. You see, there are ways to have elongated work stages that would have supported most of the senior membrane, and they also have a unique one in their wrist of the therapy that would have supported the portion of the membrane between the wrist and the shoulder on the front edge of the feet. Don't notice several curves through preserved alongside the tracks, but I think we'll leave that these grooves were likely made by either that fork midget or the steroid grass and long And we see the handprints were paired with matching footprints, indicating the stove that characters were. But in 1984, however, Kevin Cadian and one of his colleagues disagreed. Remember, just a year earlier, Cadian had published that paper to go to the territory for the walk on two legs, like work. So as far as they were concerned, the track stove to some put it possibly have been made by a pterosaur because, based on the ant research, pterosaurs... So we are at time. If you've got places to be, we can go. This video is like... I haven't watched this whole video, so I want to watch the other one. ...by the pterosaurs to see the track, and while we see a pterosaur mark for a slam, this was far from the final word on them, because over the next 10 years, we found more and more terra-ignis fossils. So in 1995, a group of people decided Mm-hmm. 